Okay. All right. So uh, we are we are recording. So uh, today we're going to be talking about the Greco-Roman world. We're actually going to be talking about two cultures that are related to each other. We're obviously we're talking about the Greco-Roman world. We're talking about the and the Greeks and the Romans, right? Exactly. Now these cultures are actually super important because we have a relationship with them. I want to show you a a uh, photograph. And this photograph, I want to show you. Here's a busted old building. You know, it's not what it used to be, right? Um, but there's something when you look at this picture. When you look at this picture, you can see that it has things that should be familiar. This. One of the common features of this building are these these columns. Now, in our own country, in our own culture, where do we find like buildings that have like columns that they they look similar, or something like this? Government, government buildings. Like, what kind of government buildings? Courthouses. Courthouses do. What what where where else do we see these types of structures, these columns, and like kind of the White, the White House definitely does. Where else? White House. Actually, in Washington, D.C. in general, if you go to D.C., the Supreme Court, the Capitol building, all these different structures are, are basically copying this. Here in Houston, if you go to like the Natural Science Museum or uh, the uh, Art Museum, part of the one of the sides of the, the Art Museum has these columns. If you go to like schools like Rice University, they have these columns. So for us in our culture, we've chosen to copy Greco-Roman architecture. And you only copy something, fashion or architecture, when you have a level of respect for. And we do have a level of respect for Greco-Roman culture. We're going to find out why that's the case today. On the very first line on the handout where it says Greek, the Greeks are considered, you're going to write down what's on the slide here, the Greeks are considered the first European civilization. We've been talking about a lot about different civilizations since we've been talking about the River Valley civilizations. We talked about Mesopotamia, the first one of the first places they ever invented farming along the Tigris and the Euphrates. We talked about Indian civilization with the development of the caste system and, and Hinduism. We we talked about even the Jewish civilization with stories of Abraham and Moses. And today we're talking kind of about the very first white civilization, first European civilization, and that's going to be the Greeks. And think about the Greeks on the second line. They're not just considered the first European civilization, but on the second line, I want you to write down, they're also considered the founders of, on that second line, I want you to write down, and this is a proper noun, so what are we gonna do with proper nouns? Yeah, yeah. Capitalize both words. They're the founders of what we call Western civilization. Western civilization. Now, some people don't really have familiarity with that term, but whenever we talk about the West, I'm not talking about like Arizona and Nevada. I'm not talking about like cowboys and Indians. When we talk about the West or Western civilization. I'm talking about civilizations, cultures that are like the United States and, and, and related cultures that if you went to this country, they may have a different language, but we are similar. We have democracies. We have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of expression. So in your mindset, if we were to have a list of countries that make up the West, if you were to make a, a list of countries that are Western civilization, we're on that list. Who else would be on that list? Countries similar to us. Canada, Canada absolutely. They're a democracy. They have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of the press. What other countries would be on that list? Mexico. Okay, so here's the thing about Mexico. Mexico has had some problems with like elections. There's two parties in Mexico that have traditionally been a power, the PAN and the PRI. And sometimes some of these parties have won over questionable things. Also in Mexico, if you ever drive in Mexico, super common, you're going to get pulled over by the cops and they're going to ask for a bribe and you're just going to give them a bribe because you don't have time to deal with this. I've been pulled over a lot driving in my life for, you know, oh, I was speeding or my thing was out, but I've never been asked for a bribe by American police. That's super common in Mexico. I don't think, though, though there are some similarities, we don't typically consider Mexico in that same level of, of countries that we call the West. So we'll put that to the side for the moment. So Western Europe, right? Germany, Denmark, France, England, Ireland, those are related countries. We consider all those countries, quote unquote, Western civilization. We have similar values. 
we embrace capitalism, we embrace democracy, and really, we're looking at Greece as being like our cultural great, 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 great grandfather. Western civilization. The next line, it says on your handout that the Greeks were characterized, and it says on the slide, by independent city-states and colonies. Independent city-states and colonies. A city-state basically means that every city was its own country. Every single city is its own country. That would be like Laporte being its own country. That would be like Deer Park, Baytown, even Little Shore Acres and Little Morgan's Point being their own country, Pasadena being a bigger one. That's what it was like. Every dot on this screen, on this map, every single Greek city-state was its own independent country, and they had colonies. Once their, their city-state got too big, they put a list of people we're going to kick out, and we're going to send you all, all these different places where green is, is where Greek city-states went, and we got too many, we're sending you away, we're sending you out. You're going to start a colony. This is going to be important. We'll revisit in a moment. But the Greeks are also important, it says on the next line, because they celebrated philosophy. This word philosophy, we're going to write down, is the quest for knowledge. Where it says philosophy, we're going to write down, it means the quest for knowledge on your handout. Write that down. Philosophy is the quest for knowledge. Literally, that word philosophy means the love of wisdom. And we've talked about some famous people so far in our class together. Last week, there was a homework assignment many of you didn't do the crash course video and there was this guy who was raised in hinduism and his parents shielded him and protected him this guy's name is siddhartha and he was dissatisfied with hinduism dissatisfied with the caste system so he he went ahead and meditated and he started his own religion based on hinduism but also rejecting hinduism this guy's name is he's the what he's the buddha right this is like a key figure you should know in indian history the buddha we talked about Abraham, the father of the Jews, Moses, the first prophet of the Jews who gave them the Ten Commandments, led them out of slavery in Egypt. Well, there's at least three different Greek philosophers you should know. These are like the most famous teachers of all of Greek history. Does anyone know these people beforehand? What do we have? Aristotle, Socrates, uh, and Plato. That's right. Boom, boom, and boom. On this next slide, these three names I need you to write down. Socrates. I need you to write down Plato and Aristotle in that order. Socrates was the first teacher. Plato studied under Socrates and Aristotle studied under Plato. One, two, and three. These are the most famous teachers Greece ever had. They are so influential. You should know them by name. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. What's that? They're on the slide. They're on the slide. Not everything, but most things are on the slide. I think there's like a few things I don't, I didn't put in. Like this next line, it says, these philosophers taught by, I want you to write down asking questions. They taught by asking questions. So listen, I could, a teacher could teach various ways. A teacher could ask Noah, Noah, hey, what do you think about COVID? A teacher could ask Daniel, Daniel, what do you think about Afghanistan? A teacher could ask Brooklyn, what do you think about the new gun law that says you don't need a permit to carry a gun openly in Texas? You could ask all those, and all these students in this room have an opinion about, or might have an opinion about those things, but there's a follow-up question that's important, and that follow-up question is why do you feel that way? Because if I ask Daniel, what do you think about this gun law? He says, I like it. Okay, end of conversation, period. But if I say, Daniel, why are you for or why are you against? What is that going to force Daniel to do? To explain and to give reasons why. And that's the thing about that's the thing about these three guys, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, that they were constantly asking that. And as a result, it says on the handout, at times they even question traditional, it says it on the slide, but you'll make sure you write it down, traditional beliefs. I'll give you an example. Uh, who is the top god that the Greeks were supposed to worship? Zeus, right? And we talked a little bit about Zeus the other day. This is a perfect example of an anthropomorphic god. Where does Zeus and his friends live in those traditional Greek stories, by the way? Where do they live? Mount Olympus, right? Is that, a, is that like a real place? Like on a map? Like can you go to Mount Olympus right now, 2021, if we went to Greece? Is that a real place? 
yeah, that's that's actually a real place. I have friends who've camped out on Mount Olympus. You and I can go there. And not only can you not not only can you go there right now, but guess what? You could have gone there back when Socrates was alive. And guess what happens if you go to Mount Olympus? Guess who's not there right now? There's no Zeus there. And guess who wasn't there back when Socrates was alive? There's no gods there. So Socrates famously started asking questions. Well, why do we even like believe these stories? Why do you believe these? Well, my parents, okay, I know your parents believe that. I know that your parents told, but why do you believe in that? These questions got these teachers in trouble. These teachers were like very much in trouble with the parents of their age. In fact, you know what they did to Socrates? They killed Socrates for teaching the kids to ask some questions that the parents weren't really prepared for their kids to come home asking. Make sure it says on the handout, he asked questions of why. Why do you believe in that? Why do you think that gun law is great? Why do you think it's bad? Why do you, what other controversial law passed in Texas just recently? People have been talking about it. There's an abortion law. There's a law that says you can't have an abortion if what is detected? A heartbeat. Some people in Texas are like, that's great. I don't think we should kill things with heartbeats. Other people say, no, that's terrible. That's a violation of women's right to choose. There's different, and, and people have opinions. But a more sophisticated question may not be, are you for that or against it? Maybe a more sophisticated question is, hey, why? Why are you for that? Why are you against it? That's going to require you to dig a little bit deeper. And that's what these guys did. Now, moreover, on the handout on the slide, it says most of these city states had what type of government? Democracy. democracy. Now, democracy is actually a Greek word. It means rule by the people. But there's a problem with democracy in Greece. Now, in our country, what do you need to do to be able to vote in the United States? Be 18 and what else? Be a citizen. Those are like the two biggest benchmarks. Do you need to know anything about politics in the United States to be able to vote? No. You could just vote because, man, I know Donald Trump was on a TV show called The Apprentice. That's cool. I'll vote for that guy. That's all you might know about him. Like, done. He's got my vote. Or you might look at Barack Obama and say, he's a black man. That'd be cool. It's about time we had a black president. Done. You got my vote. Like, there are people who literally know nothing about politics. And that's like, oh, Hillary Clinton, she's a woman. Hey, first woman, pre sign me up for Hillary. I'm with her. You don't need to know anything to be able to vote. You can, and maybe you should, but you don't have to. There's no like requirement of you. Some people make really wise choices. Other people are like, eh, parents told me to vote for this person. I'm going to vote for him. The problem with Greece, though, it says on the slide, who got to vote in Greece? Not just men. Like, it's not even that this was like a patriarchy thing, because most men didn't own property. The thing about Greece, they're a democracy, kind of, because men got to vote if you own property. And guess what? That eliminated a whole bunch of men. It eliminated the working class, eliminated people who weren't educated, eliminated just regular everyday people. There is voting, but a very small amount of people. And in fact, as it says, women had limited rights. Women automatically, you got crossed off the list as soon as you were born and someone said it's a girl, that person's never going to be able to vote in ancient Greek civilization. And in fact, did we allow women to vote in our country when we first started in 1776? No, women didn't get the right to vote to the 20th century. Former slaves got to write. Uh, the former black male slaves got to vote before women did in the United States, which makes some people crazy. Like a black man had greater rights than a white woman in the year 1905. A black man had greater rights politically, officially, electorally than a white woman did because she didn't have the right to vote. Yes, sir. That's a great question, and I don't have a specific answer for you. That's a good question. I, I don't know, but I do know that you have. And actually, that was the same rule our country had. When we first started in 1776, when we started voting, you have to own land. Not even all white men could vote. You had to have property. And that was a change that was made later. But originally, the plan was you're not a grown up. You're not. You're not you don't have to, uh, you don't get to say unless you show that you're worth something and you show me that you're worth something by actually owning some land. We don't want bums to be voting. We don't want people who do nothing to be voting. 
And that was the rule that they had. Slavery on the handout, make sure you write down it was common. Now this slavery has nothing to do with race because the average white Greek person, guess what the color of the, their slave was in Greece? White it has nothing to do with race. You have white people enslaving white people. And it's also much broader than we think. One of the most common reasons you got enslaved is that you owed money and you were in debt to someone. Now in our country today, if you get a bunch of credit cards and you just like charge, 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 and you cannot pay it off, like what could you do to solve that problem? You can declare what? You can declare bankruptcy, and there's a mechanism to deal with that. But listen, there's no declaring bankruptcy 300 BCE. If I owe you so much money and it's clear I'm not gonna pay it back, I as a teacher, I get in a bunch of debt, you know what the solution is? I'm gonna be your slave for seven years until I pay off that debt. And so listen, slavery in Greece isn't, oh, you are on my farm. You could have literally a teacher be your slave. And guess what? My kids are going to have the best math tutor ever because that that math tutor, that algebra two teacher owed me money, never pay me back. Now, Mrs. Holloway, she's she's my slave. She's going to be tutoring my kids because she's one of the best math teachers we have. Hey, she should have thought about that before charging all that credit cards for rabbits. You know, Miss Holloway should have thought twice about that. Slavery was common. Slavery was common. And she is one of our best math teachers. So your, your slave could be a teacher, your lawyer could be a slave, an architect could be a slave, and these were fellow Greeks, fellow white people. Race was not even, not even a thought about what would qualify someone as a slave. Almost every land owning man owned at least one slave. Now Greece has a problem, and the problem is on the map on the screen that they have a rival to the east, and it says on the handout that uh, that the Greeks had rivals to east in in the massive and the multi-ethnic. You'll write down Persian Empire. There is a massive and a multi-ethnic Persian Empire, and this is a big problem for them because if you look at the map, if you look at the screen. You have this huge empire, the Persian Empire, with a bunch of ethnic groups. This Persian Empire, this is all the Persian Empire. They've conquered Egypt, they've conquered Assyria and Armenia, Babylon, modern day Iran, modern day Afghanistan. The Persian Empire is a huge empire. And take a look at how Greece compares to it. Greece, Greece is right here. And what do we already say we know about all the Greek city-states? They're all united as one country? No, every city is its own deal. What do you think the Persians might want to do to small, fragmented, on their own Greece? Why not? If you look at the Persians, they've conquered all these other cultures, all these other areas they've conquered. How easy would it be? What a joke it would be to have to fight 12 small, independent, fragmented Greek city-states that can't even get their stuff together to unite under one flag. Should be easy, right? And this is exactly what we're gonna see play out. It says on the handout that there was something called the, the Persian Wars. It says the Persian Wars saw the fragmented Greeks invaded twice. Make sure you write down. It saw them invaded twice. If you were to place bets, and on one hand you have this massive empire that goes from India to Egypt to the border of Greece, that's one country. They have an army of a quarter million professional soldiers. Soldiers from Ethiopia, soldiers from Egypt, soldiers from Babylon, soldiers from India, quarter million. And then they're gonna fight Greece. Like, who are you gonna put money on if you were to bet? OK, yeah, you might for like, the, you know, like, oh, uh, you know, but like wisdom tells you who's going to win this. The Persians like they've already conquered the world. It turns out that Pharaoh and his pyramids not strong enough to say no to the Persian Empire. Like the Persians are the real deal. Greece, how in the world can they win? It doesn't make sense. They are invaded twice. Now, some of you may have seen a movie that's popular that kind of touches upon this. 
And there's a, a movie, it's based on a graphic novel, a comic book about these Persian Wars. And there's a famous line in this movie that you probably will have heard, a line that says, this is Sparta. What movie does that come from? From 300. So there's this movie, which is really like a comic book <laughs> called 300. And it's only like loosely, 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 loosely related to a real event. But it turns out the Persians invaded Greece. And it turns out the Greeks were literally outnumbered. And it turns out we know that one of the Greek armies was led by these 300 Spartans. These numbers don't look good because the Persians had an army of at least 100,000. If you don't know how much that is, can you imagine seeing the Texans play? They play in Reliance Stadium. I think that stadium has like 75,000. So we're not even enough capacity at 75,000. So imagine the Texans playing every seat filled plus another 30 fighting an army of 300. That's half your graduating class. You're not gonna do well in that kind of scenario. And listen, in truth, the, the Greeks lost that battle, but those 300 died after killing thousands of Persians. Like it doesn't even make sense how this Greek army of 300 could so famously fight and do so well. But in fact, that's a little precursor of what happened in general. It says on the handout, both times you'll write down the Greeks won. And that's crazy because they're outnumbered. That's crazy because the Greeks weren't even united. That's crazy because the Persian Empire was one of the best empires on the face of the planet. Multi-ethnic, working together, black Ethiopians in their army, Persians, Babylonians, in, all working together, and they were defeated. If you're a Greek, how are you going to be feeling about your culture with not one but two victories against the Persians? Yeah, you're going to kind of be full of yourself. You're going to be like, oh, we're totally, you know, you're going to buy your own press. And you're like, we're totally the best culture on the planet. And that is how the Greeks felt. And it says on the slide that there's really two cities that would come out as leaders. We've already identified one of them in that movie 300, that famous line that says this is, what, what does it say? This is Sparta, one of the cities you should know by name, where it says on the handout leading cities, the Greeks were Sparta is one. You'll write down Sparta. Where it says leading cities, you're going to write down Sparta. And I don't know how your vision is. Mine's terrible. Can you read the other city on that map? What is it? Athens. Athens, Athens is A-T-H-E-N-S. If you cannot read that far, like I could not. A-T-H-E-N-S. So these are like the two big cities. You have Athens and you have Sparta. Those are like the most important cities. And listen, because they're the biggest and the most important, they have a lot in common. They have the same religion. They have the same language. They eat the same food. They have the same values. But they're the two biggest ones. What do you think their relations are going to be like? They're going to get along. They're going to be rivals. Think about like us. Like there's other cities in our area. Is Kima very far from us? Seabrook very far from us. Morgan's Point far, Shore Acres far. No, but you don't like, oh, we got the Laporte Kima rivalry everyone knows about. Like, do you care about anything like that? Of course not. You care about the only other city that you go to the same churches, you go to the same restaurants, you go to the same grocery stores, you listen to the same songs they do. What school do you have a rivalry with? Baytown. <laughs> Baytown. <laughs> oh, what's going on across that bridge? No. You don't care about Baytown. It's your park. Their two largest cities have a rivalry. In the same way, though they are the same people, they're both Greeks, the Spartans and Athenians did not agree. They didn't like each other. And so it says on the handout that these two powerful city states were often at war with each other. In fact, there was a terribly long war with a funny name called the Peloponnesian War. No, that's great that Greece fought the Persians not once but twice. That's awesome. But what's going to happen if my two biggest cities fight each other for 10 years? Every single year we bleed and die. We burn each other's cities. What's going to happen to the security of Greece if we're busy just fighting one another? What's that? It's not going to be good. And there's going to be someone who's going to take advantage of that not being good. It says on the handout, 
though culturally united, says on the handout, though culturally united, the Greeks were politically divided. Though culturally united, the Greeks were politically divided. They had the same language, the same religion, the same culture, the same food, but they weren't one. Every, every city is doing its own thing. Every city is its own country. And guess what? That's bad news because someone has been watching from close you basically fighting each other. And that person who's been watching it is one of the most famous men who ever lived. It's this guy right here, Alexander the Great. We're going to write down on the handout that the Greeks would be conquered by a Macedonian leader. Macedonians, they're actually not Greek. They're semi-Greek. They're close. They're cousins, but they're not Greek. And this guy, this Macedonian from the north, write down where it says from the north, Alexander the Great. The Greeks would be conquered by this semi-Greek, this almost Greek, a guy named Alexander the Great. He would be the one to take advantage of the disunity and make Greece for the very first time ever one country. And that's cool. That's never been done before. Good for you, Alexander the Great. But Alexander the Great actually was not like content with that. He wasn't satisfied with that. And it says on the handout, not only did he unify the Greeks, but he also wanted revenge. And if there's any country that you might want to, I don't know, get back at for having messed with you, who might they want to mess with? The Persians. The Persians had come to their country twice. They failed twice. But now Alexander says, look, I know we're still small. Like, hey, I'm glad you conquered like those 10 small cities. But Greece, you're still no bigger than you were before. Does it seem like a wise or a good idea for Greece to invade still the largest empire on the face of the planet? Does it make sense for the kid who was bullied? And that's great. You, you survived the bully twice, but now for the bully to go and attack the big kid. Does that make sense? I mean, to me, having been bullied many times, <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. I just want to stay away from that kid. You know, like, you know, I'm just going to keep walking. But that's not Alexander the Great. He decides to invade the largest empire in the face of the planet with his Greek army. It says on the handout, not only did he unify the Greeks, he sought revenge and invaded the Persian Empire. And guess what? He won. On the map, on the screen, everywhere in red, his army went, they fought, they won. They fought and won in Asia Minor. They fought and won in Israel. They fought and won in Egypt. They went to Babylon and they went to per Persepolis. They went to modern day Afghanistan. They actually crossed the Indus River. That's where India is. And Indian armies were super tough because, you know, like if you have armies, like, okay, you got guys on foot, that's cool. But you know what's better than having guys on foot is having guys on horses. What's better than having guys on horses if you're an Indian army? On elephants. There's two types of elephants in the world. There's the African elephant and the Indian elephant. We've never domesticated the African elephant. You go to Africa, they have elephants. No human has ever ridden an African elephant. But in India, they have domesticated them. What's that? You, let's see. Uh, good luck. Good luck. In India, they have domesticated the Indian elephant. If you go to zoos, all those zoos, you'll never see an African elephant in a zoo. They're Indian elephants in our zoos. If back when we had circuses, before it was like not right or not ethical, there was never African elephants. Those were Indian elephants. These Indian armies have elephants, and guess what? Alexander the Great beat Indian armies with Afri with Indian elephants. Even that's like a ridiculous. Like, how does this guy with his small army he conquers everywhere he goes? That's another ridiculous story, and that is what happened. It says on your handout. He quickly built an empire, and if everything in yellow is what he conquered, how many continents did he conquer part of? He's from Greece. That's in Europe. Egypt is in what continent? That's Africa. And then he conquers the Persian Empire. That's Asia. We're going to write down that he, um, on the handout, that he uh, built an empire on three continents. Alexander the Great. And this is why he's called Alexander the Great. His small army of Greek soldiers, here's a model of their fighting. They had a formation called the Phalanx. This is like how their 
army was organized and kind of like fit together in this 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 united group and they were trained to like run at full speed into the enemy and it freaks you out and you gave up alexander was so confident and so you know proud of himself that if you look at this map what is the average city named on this map he named all those cities after himself Everywhere he went, he said, you know what? What should we call this city? I don't think we should name the city after me. And hey, how about this other city? I think we should name this up. All these cities on this map, he named after himself. Alexandria or Alexandropolis. There are Alexandrias in Afghanistan, in Iran, in Egypt, in modern day Iraq, Turkey. All these named after himself. It says on your handout. Alexandria, cities named after Alexander the Great were built everywhere, but the most famous one still is called Alexandria right now. Still has over a million people living in it. And it's this one right here in Egypt. We'll write it down where it says the most famous one was built in Egypt. Today, if you and I go to Egypt, the largest city in Egypt is what city? The capital of Egypt. What's the capital of Egypt? Cairo. And the second largest city in Egypt is Alexandria. Right now, still on the coast. They still have a major city in Arabic speaking Egypt named after a white guy who lived 300 years before Jesus was born. Still, it's Alexandria. There was something that made the Alexandria Egypt more famous than all the others. It says on the handout, it hosted the world's largest library. Everyone knew that if you wanted to study, if you wanted to be educated, there's one place you need to go. You need to go to Africa to be studied. You need to go to Africa to be well educated because it's only in Africa, it's only in Egypt that you're gonna find the world's largest library on planet Earth, Alexandria. It was destroyed sadly in the Arab invasions. Muslims invaded in the 600s. And there's a story that when they went, they found this library and they said, well, I got two questions. Do these books have information found in the Quran? That's a yes or a no. And so some of them said, well, yeah, you know, some of these books have the same stories as the Quran. Well, if it's already in the Quran, we don't need it because the Quran is the last revelation. It's the final, it's the seal of the prop. We don't need it, we can burn it. And if there's books in there that contradict the Quran, do we need those books? No, so no matter what this story says, the invading Arab armies burned every book of the library. Now, we're not sure if that's a true story, but that is an early story that is told about the largest library humans had ever built at the time. Below that, with the spread of Greek, the Greek Empire also came the spread, you'll write down, of Greek culture, the spread of Greek culture. Everywhere Alexander the Great went, he brought his culture with him. I'm going to give you some examples. First example, what country is this map of here? That's Afghanistan. By context clues, things you can figure out. Well, number one, what's the capital? Kabul, right? We saw pictures, video of Kabul in the last few weeks of people trying to get out, holding on to the sides of planes to get out of Kabul as Kabul fell to the Taliban. They share a border with Pakistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. Those are all the neighborhood that is Afghanistan. There's a lot of languages they speak in Afghanistan today. Many languages, many tribes in Afghanistan. But this on the right is a is something we found in a rock inscription. And the, the title of this slide tells you what language is this inscription in? It's in Greek. If you look at there's and this is actually bilingual. This is Aramaic. Just like when you get a letter from the school district, sometimes we get a letter and the front side's in English and the back side is in what language usually if they give you a handout. It's in, in which one? In Spanish. In the same way, if you look at this, this top one is in Greek and this bottom one is in Aramaic. Guess what language they're speaking in Afghanistan 300 years before Jesus is born? What language are they speaking? They're speaking Greek. This is an example of this vocabulary word on your slot, on the handout where it says, Hellenization, this is a super duper 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 important vocabulary word, just like we looked at this word, anthropomorphic, the big kid word. This word you should know. 
Hellenization. What do you think you're going to write down where it says it's a spread of what culture do you think we're going to write down it's a spread of? It's a spread of language culture? No. Oh, Try yeah, again. Like Greek culture. Make sure you write that down. In our short time we have left, let's look at one more picture. Um, on the far right, we have Buddha, right? We talked about him recently, not too long ago. Stereotypically in your mind, how do you see Buddha? Like in a restaurant or a place where you get your nails done? He's what now? Okay, and maybe kind of a big guy. Sometimes Buddha is kind of a big guy. But Buddha's not depicted like this. In fact, our oldest depictions of Buddha are not actually a statue of Buddha, but as just his what? His feet. If you wanted to have a representation of Jesus without a painting or picture or statue, how could you symbolize Jesus? The cross, the Buddhists at first, they only had feet print of Buddha because we even have an expression in English. We say, oh, you're following in your father's footsteps. It doesn't mean like you're literally following. It just, it's an expression, right? That's how Buddhists work. But guess when Alexander the Great comes to Afghanistan, they bring their gods, and what do we call those? What do we call the clothes the Greeks wore? Another word other than robe? Togas. And so the Greeks have these gods with these togas, and the Buddhists say, you know what? That's kind of cool. I want to have a statue of a god wearing a toga. So when we see the very first Buddhist statues, they're dressed with Greek togas. They're dressed like that. This is an example of what vocabulary word? Hellenization. Everywhere the Greeks go, they spread their culture. We're going to continue to talk about this tomorrow. We're going to finish. There's no homework tonight other than what should you finish if you've not completed it already? Assignments where? And teams. I look forward to seeing each and every one of you tomorrow. Have stuff submitted to me. Have a super great day. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah.